question, what does it mean, and how may we know whether we love God? First, he who loves God desires his presence. Lovers cannot be long asunder. They soon have their fainting fits for want of a sight of the object of their love. A soul deeply in love with God desires the enjoyment of him, his ordinances, his word, his prayers. David was ready to faint away and die when he had not a sight of God. My soul fainteth for God. Psalm 84, verse 2. Such as care not for ordinances, but say, When will the Sabbath be over? Plainly show a lack of love to God. Second, he who loves God does not love sin. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Psalm 97, verse 10. The love of God and the love of sin can no more mix together than iron and clay. Every sin loved strikes at the being of God, but he who loves God has an antipathy against sin. He who would part two lovers is a hateful person. God and the believing soul are two lovers. Sin parts between them. Therefore the soul is implacably set against sin. By this try your love to God. How could Delilah say she loved Samson when she entertained correspondence with the Philistines, who were Samson's mortal enemies? How can he say he loves God who loves sin, which is God's enemy? Third, he who loves God is not much in love with anything else. His love is very cool to worldly things. His love to God moves swiftly, as the sun in the firmament. To the world it moves slowly, as the sun on the dial. The love of the world eats out the heart of religion. It chokes good affections, as dirt puts out the fire. The world was a dead thing to Paul. The world is crucified unto me. Galatians 6.14, and I to the world. In Paul, we may see both the picture and pattern of a mortified man. He that loves God uses the world, but chooses God. The world is his pension, but God is his portion. Psalm 119.57, the world engages him, but God delights and satisfies him. He says as David, God, my exceeding joy, the gladness of or cream of my joy, Psalm 43, 4. Fourth, he who loves God cannot live without him. Things we love we cannot be without. A man can do without music or flowers, but not food. So a soul deeply in love with God looks upon himself as undone without him. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like them that go down into the pit, Psalm 143, 7. He says, as Job in 30, 28, I went mourning without the sun. I have starlight, I need the sun of righteousness, I enjoy not the sweet presence of my God. Is God your chief good, and you cannot live without him? Alas, how we show we have no love to God, who can do well enough without him. Let us have but corn and oil, and we shall never hear a complaint of the lack of God. Fifth, he who loves God will be at any pains to get him. What pains the merchant takes, what hazards he runs to have a rich return from the Indies. As it is said, the merchant races to the farthest Indies. Jacob loved Rachel, and he could endure the heat by day and the frost by night that he might enjoy her. A soul that loves God will take any pains for the fruition of him. My soul followeth hard after thee, Psalm 63, verse 8. Love is said to be the pendulum of the soul by Augustine. It is as the weight which sets the clock going. It is much in prayer, weeping, fasting. It strives as in agony that he may obtain him whom his soul loves. Plutarch reports of the Gauls, an ancient people of France, that after they had tasted the sweet wine of Italy, they never rested till they had arrived at that country. He who is in love with God never rests till he has a part in him. I will seek him whom my soul loveth. Song of Solomon 3, 2. How can they say they love God who are not industrious in the use of means to obtain him? A slothful man hideth his hand in his bosom, Proverbs 19.24. He is not in agony, but in lethargy. If Christ and salvation would drop as a ripe fig into his mouth, he would be content to have them, but he is loath to put himself out to too much trouble. 
Does he love his friend who will not undertake a journey to see him? Sixth, he who loves God prefers him before estate and life. Firstly, before estate, for whom have I suffered, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Paul in Philippians chapter 3 verse 8, who that loves a rich jewel would not part with a flower for it. Galatius, Marquis of Vico, parted with a fair estate to jo enjoy God and his pure ordinances. When a Jesuit persuaded him to return to his popish religion in Italy, promising him a large sum of money, he said, Let their money perish with them who esteem all the gold in the world worth one day's communion with Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit. Secondly, before life, they loved not their lives unto the death. Revelation 12:11. Love to God carries the soul above the love of life and the fear of death. Seventh, he who loves God loves his favorites, the saints, as it is said. 1 John 5, 1. The mind reacts to the likeness of an object just as it does to the object itself. To love a man for his grace and the more we see of God in him, the more we love him, is an infallible sign of love to God. The wicked pretend to love God, but hate and persecute his children. Does he love his prince who abuses his statue or tears up his picture? They seem indeed to show great reverence to saints departed. They have great reverence for St. Paul and St. Stephen and St. Luke. They canonize dead saints but persecute living saints. And do they love God? Can it be imagined that he loves God who hates his children because they are like him? If Christ were alive again, he would not escape a second persecution. Eighth, if we love God, we cannot be fearful of dishonoring him. We cannot but be fearful of dishonoring him, as the more a child loves his father, the more he is afraid to displease him, and we weep and mourn when we have offended our heavenly father. Peter went out and wept bitterly, Matthew twenty six seventy five. Peter might well think that Christ dearly loved him when he took him up to the mount where he was transfigured and showed him the glory of heaven in a vision that he should deny Christ after he had received such signal tokens of his love, broke his heart with grief. He wept bitterly. Are our eyes dropping tears of grief for sin against God? It is a blessed evidence of our love to God, and such shall find mercy. He shows mercy unto thousands of them that love him. Here is the use. Let us be lovers of God. We love our food, and shall we not love him that gives it? All the joy we hope for in heaven is in God, and shall not he who shall be our joy then be our love now? It is a saying of Augustine. Is it not punishment enough, Lord, not to love thee? And again, I would hate my own soul if I did not find it loving God. Question, what are the incentives to provoke and inflame our love to God? First, God's benefits bestowed on us. If a prince bestows continual favors on a subject, and that subject has any ingenuity, he cannot but love his prince. God is constantly heaping benefits upon us, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Acts 14.17 As streams of water out of the rock followed Israel wherever they went, so God's blessings follow us every day. We swim in a sea of mercy. That heart is hard that is not prevailed with by all God's blessings to love Him. Love attracts love, it is said. Kindness works even on a brute. The ox knows his owner. Second, love to God would make duties of religion facile and pleasant. I confess that to him who has no love to God, her religion must needs be a burden. And I wonder not to hear him say what a weariness it is to serve the Lord. It is like rowing against the tide. But love oils the wheels. It makes duty a pleasure. Why are the angels so swift and winged in God's service, but because they love him? Jacob thought seven years, but little for the love he bare to Rachel. Love is never weary. He who loves money is not weary of telling it, and he who loves God is not weary of serving him. 
Third, it is advantageous. There is nothing lost by love to God. I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians second nine, uh, chapter 2, verse 9. Such glorious rewards are laid up for them that love God, as that Augustine says, they are not only transcending of our reason, but faith itself is not able to comprehend them. A crown is the highest ensign of worldly glory, but God has promised a crown of life to them that love him, and a never-fading crown. James 1.12, 1 Peter 5.4 4. Fourth, by loving God we know that he loves us. We love him because he first loved us. 1 John 5.19 If ice melts, it is because the sun has shone upon it. So if the frozen heart melts in love, it is because the sun of righteousness has shone upon it. Question, what means should be used to excite our love to God? First, labor to know God aright. The schoolmen say, truly, we cannot love that which we do not know. God is the most eligible good. All excellencies which lie scattered in the creature are united in Him. He is wisdom, beauty, Riches, love, all concentrate in him. How fair was that tulip which had the colors of all tulips in it. All perfections and sweetnesses are eminently in God. Did we know God more, and by the eye of faith see his orient beauty, our hearts would be fired with love to him. Second, make the scriptures familiar to you. Augustine says that before his conversion he took no pleasure in Scripture, but afterwards it was his chief delight. The book of God reveals God to us in his holiness, wisdom, veracity, and truth. It represents him as rich in mercy and encircled with promises. Augustine calls the Scripture a golden epistle or love letter sent from God to us. By reading this love letter, we become more enamored with God. By reading lascivious books, comedies, romances, novels, etc., lust is excited. Third, meditate much upon God, and this will promote love to Him. While I was musing, the fire burned. Psalm 39, 3. Meditation is as bellows to the affections. Meditate on God's love in the gift of Christ. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, John 3.16, that God should give Christ to us and not to angels that fell, that the Son of Righteousness should shine in our horizon, that He is revealed to us and not to others. What wonderful love is this! Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? Proverbs 6.28 Who can meditate on God's love? Who can tread on these hot coals and his heart not burn in love? Beg a heart to love God. The affection of love is natural, but not the grace of love. Galatians 5.22 this fire of love is kindled from heaven. Beg God that it may burn upon the altar of your heart. Surely the request is pleasing to God, and he will not deny such a prayer as, Lord, give me a heart to love thee. Point 7. To such as love me and keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. Love and obedience, like two sisters, must go hand in hand. If ye love me, keep my commandments. John 14.15 There is a saying, we show our love by performing the work. The son that loves his father will obey him. Obedience pleases God. To obey is better than sacrifice, For Samuel 15.22 in sacrifice, a dead beast only is offered. In obedience, a living soul. In sacrifice, only a part of the fruit is offered. In obedience, fruit and tree and all. A man offers himself up to God. Keep my commandments. It is not said God shows mercy to thousands that know his commandments, but that keep them. Knowing his commandments without keeping them does not entitle any to mercy. The commandment is not only a rule of knowledge, but of duty. 
God gives us His commandments not only as a landscape to look upon, but as His will and testament which we are to perform. A good Christian, like the sun, not only sends forth light, but makes a circuit round the world. He has not only the light of knowledge, but moves in a sphere of obedience. First, we should keep the commandments from faith. Our obedience ought, as it is said, to spring from faith. It is therefore called the obedience of faith. In Romans 16:26, Abel, by faith, offered up a better sacrifice than Cain. Hebrews 11:4. Faith is a vital principle without which all our services are dead works. Hebrews 6:1. It meliorates and sweetens obedience and makes it come off with a better relish. Question, but why must faith be mixed with obedience in the commandments? Why must faith be mixed with obedience to the commandments? Because faith eyes Christ in every duty, in whom both the person and offering are accepted. The high priest under the law laid his hand upon the head of the slain beast, which pointed to the Messiah, Exodus 29.10. So faith in every duty lays its hand upon the head of Christ. His blood expiates their guilt, and the sweet odor of His intercession perfumes our works of obedience. He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Ephesians 1, 6. Second, keeping the commandments must be uniform. We must make conscience of one commandment as well as of another. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect to all thy commandments. Psalm 119, verse 6. Every commandment has the same stamp of divine authority upon it, and if I obey only one precept because God commands, by the same reason I must obey all. Some obey the commands of the first table, but are careless of the duties of the second. Some of the second, and not of the first table of the law. Physicians have a rule that when the body sweats in one part and is cold in another, it is a sign of distemper. So when men seem zealous in some duties of religion, but are cold and frozen in others, it is a sign of hypocrisy. We must have respect to all God's commandments. Question, but who can keep all His commandments? There is a fulfilling God's commands and a keeping of them. Though we cannot fulfill all, yet we may be said to keep them in an evangelical sense. We may build, though not complete. We, may, we keep the commandments evangelically, firstly, when we make conscience of every command, when, though we come short in every duty, we dare not neglect any duty. Secondly, when our desire is to keep every commandment. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Psalm 119, verse 5, what we lack in strength, we make up in will. Thirdly, when we grieve that we can do no better, weep when we fail, prefer bills of complaint against ourselves and judge ourselves for our failings. Romans 7, 24, fourthly, when we endeavor to obey every commandment, I press toward the mark. Philippians 3, 14, we strive as in agony. And if it lay in our power, we would fully comport with every commandment. Fifthly, when falling short and unable to come up to the full latitude of the law, we look to Christ's blood to sprinkle our imperfect obedience, and with the grains of His merits cast into the scales to make it pass current. This, in an evangelical sense, is to keep all the commandments, and though it be not to satisfaction, yet... It is to acceptation. Third, keeping God's commandments must be voluntary. If ye be willing and obedient, Isaiah 1.19, God required a free will offering, Deuteronomy 16.10. David will run the way of God's commandments, that is, freely and cheerfully, Psalm 119, verse 32. Lawyers have a rule that adverbs are better than adjectives, that it is not the doing much, but the doing well. A musician is not commended for playing long, but for playing well. 
Obeying God willingly is accepted. An old saying, righteous deeds done unwillingly are worthless. The Lord hates that which is forced, which is a paying a tax rather than an offering. Cain served God grudgingly. He brought his sacrifice, not his heart. To obey God's commandments unwillingly is like the devils who came out of the men possessed at Christ's command, but with reluctance and against their will. Matthew 8:29. It is said, Obedience is the chief thing, and this not through fear of punishment, but for love of God. Good duties must not be pressed nor beaten out of us as the waters came from the rock when Moses smote it with his rod, but obedience must drop freely from us as myrrh from the tree or honey from a honeycomb. If a willing mind is lacking, the flower is lacking to perfume our obedience and to make it a sweet-smelling savor to God. That we may keep God's commandments willingly, let these things be well weighed. Number one, our willingness is more esteemed than our service. David counsels Solomon not only to serve God, but with a willing mind. First Chronicles 28, 9. The will makes sin to be worse, and duty to be better. To obey willingly shows we do it with love, and this crowns all our services, Point two, there is that in the lawgiver which may make us willing to obey the commandments, which is God's indulgence to us. First, God does not require the perfect obedience as absolutely necessary to salvation. He expects not perfect obedience. He requires sincerity only. Do but act from a principle of love and aim at honoring God in your obedience, and it is accepted. Secondly, in the gospel, a surety is admitted. The law would not favor us so far, but now God so indulges us that what we cannot do of ourselves, we may do by proxy. Jesus Christ is a surety of a better testament. Hebrews 7.22, we fall short in everything, but God looks upon us in our surety. Christ having fulfilled all righteousness, it is as if we had fulfilled the law in our own persons. God gives strength, point three, to do what he requires. The law called for obedience, but though it required brick, it gave no straw. But in the gospel, God with his commands gives power. Make ye a new heart. Ezekiel 18.31 Alas, it is above our strength. We may as well make a new world. A new heart also will I give you. Ezekiel 36.26 God commands us to cleanse ourselves, wash you, make you clean. Isaiah 1.16 But who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Job 14.4 Therefore the precept is turned into a promise. From all your filthiness will I cleanse you, Ezekiel 36.25. When the child cannot go, the nurse takes it by the hand. I taught Ephraim also to go, taking them by their arms, Hosea 11.3. Third, there is that in God's commandments which may make us willing. They are not burdensome. First, a Christian, so far as he is born again, regenerate, consents to God's command. I consent to the law that it is good. Romans seven sixteen. What is done with consent is no burden. If a virgin gives her consent, the wedding goes on cheerfully. If a subject consents to his prince's laws because he sees the equity and reasonableness of them, they are not irksome. A regenerate person, in his judgment, approves, and in his will consents to God's commandments, and therefore they are not burdensome. Secondly, God's commandments are sweetened with joy and peace. Cicero questions whether that can be properly called a burden, which is carried with delight and pleasure. It said, it is a task performed with joy. Is it rightly so called? If a man carries a bag of money that has been given him, it is heavy, but the delight takes off the burden. When God gives inward joy, it makes the commandments delightful. I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Isaiah 56, 7. Joy is like 
oil to the wheels which makes a Christian run in the way of God's commandment so that it is not burdensome. Third, God's commands are advantageous. They are preventative of evil, a curb bit to check us from sin. What mischief should we not run into if we had not afflictions to humble us and the commandments to restrain us? God's commandments keep us within bounds as the yoke keeps the beast from straggling. We should be thankful to God for precepts. Had he not set his commandments as a hedge or bar in our way, we might have run to hell and never stopped. There is nothing in the commandments but what is for our good, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes which I command thee for thy good. Deuteronomy 10:13 God commands us to read his word and what hurt is in this he bespangles the word with promises as if a father should bid his son read his last will and testament wherein he makes over a fair estate to his heir he bids us pray and tells us if we ask it shall be given Matthew 7:7 7, 7. ask power against sin ask salvation and it shall be given if you had a friend who should say, Come when you will to me, I will supply you with money. Would you think it a trouble to visit that friend often? God commands us to fear him, but fear thy God. Leviticus 25:43. There is honey in the mouth of this command. His mercy is on them that fear him. Luke 1:50. God commands us to believe, and why so? Believe, and thou shalt be saved. Acts 16.31 Salvation is the crown set upon the head of faith. Good reason, then, have we to obey God's commands willingly, since they are for our good, and are not so much our duty as our privilege. Fourth, God's commands are ornamental. There is a saying of Silvanius, God's commands do not burden us, but adorn us. It is an honor to be employed in a king's service, and much more to be employed in his by whom kings reign. To walk in God's commandments proves us to be wise. Behold, I have taught you statutes. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom. Deuteronomy 4, 5, and 6. To be wise is a great honor. We may say of every commandment of God, as in Proverbs 4, 9, it shall give to thy head an ornament of grace. Fifthly, the commands of God are infinitely better than the commands of sin, which are intolerable. Let a man under the command of any lust, and how he tires himself, what hazards he runs to endangering his health and soul, that he may satisfy his lust. They weary themselves to commit iniquity, Jeremiah 9, 5. And are not God's commandments more equal, facile, pleasant than the commands of sin? Chrysostom says true, to act virtue is easier than to act vice. Temperance is less troublesome than drunkenness. Meekness is less troublesome than passion and envy. There is more difficulty in the contrivance and pursuit of a wicked design than in obeying the commands of God. Hence a sinner is said to travail with iniquity in Psalm 7, verse 14. A woman, while she is in travail, is in pain to show what pain and trouble a wicked man has in bringing forth sin. Many have gone with more pains to hell than others have to heaven. This may make us obey the commandments willingly. Sixth, willingness in obedience makes us resemble the angels. The cherubims, types resenting, representing the angels, are described with wings displayed to show how ready the angels are to serve God. God no sooner speaks the word, but they are ambitious to obey. How are they ravished with joy while praising God? In heaven we shall be as the angels, and by our willingness to obey God's commands, we should be like them. Here. This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web 
at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com, by phone at 780-450-3730, by fax at 780-468-1096, or by mail at 4710-37A Avenue, Edmonton, that's E-D-M-O-N-T-O-N, Alberta, abbreviated capital A, capital B, Canada, T6L 3T5. You may also request a free printed catalog. And remember that John Calvin, in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 7.31, writes, God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God. For when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies, and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle was adopted by the Papists, all those fictitious modes of worship in which they absurdly exercise themselves would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the Papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important when he says that God had commanded no such thing and that it never came to his mind, as though he had said that men assume too much wisdom when they devise what he never required, nay, what he never knew.